OK, uh, so thanks for sticking around for my session. Hopefully, some of our, our minds aren't too blown from what you just saw from setting and facing the right side and setting the ball to the right side. I know my mind was blown when I first saw it this summer. I was a believer by the end of the summer when I saw how good our women's national team offense was. So it took me some, took me some time. But um, yeah, so I'm going to talk kind of around training the read skill. That's the general premise of what I'm going to go into today. Um, just for the athletes, first off, thank you. Second off, this will be the worst hour of a practice you've ever experienced because it'll be you'll be cold, come in, do some stuff, sit down, I'll blabber for a bunch, so I apologize. But um, So there's a couple main points. i got to follow them all on my phone so I don't forget any of them. I'm not texting. Um, so one of the biggest pieces are why we're trying to train read skills and reading in general. And Tom actually went over a lot about setting. I'm going to go through every other skill. I don't really know if I need to reiterate much on the setting, but there's a couple scientific principles around reading that will apply to what Tom talked about. So the first off, we're trying to just information gather is what reading is really is, reading in our sport, is information gather to try and make informed and accurate decisions as fast as we can, right? And I also heard earlier a couple of comments on trying to understand when an athlete makes an error we need to start thinking as coaches, is it that they don't have the technical skills to actually execute, or do they not have the read skills to know what skill they should be doing or be able to do it fast enough? And when you really start to dive into a lot of errors that your athletes make, what you'll probably find out is a lot of them are on read errors. If you take the read out, they could do the skill. They could execute it right in a vacuum without the read being required. The reason they're failing or they're struggling is they don't have the read component. And myself included, the default as a coach is, well, let's go back and let's block rep this. Oh, look, they can do it perfectly in this environment that's really controlled. And then we go back into an environment where they have to read and they still haven't learned how to read. Okay, so as a coach, I really try and iterate or reiterate the fact that the read component is a component in every single drill we do. There's a read cue that we want our athletes to be thinking about in every single drill we do. Just like there's a technical cue. Might be working on, you know, being dead on our second step on our, you know, it could be our shape of our hands for setters. Whatever our cue is technically, we can also have a read cue. So I like to write out my practice plan and I'll write our technical cue for that drill for those positions and I'll write out what the actual read cue is as well so that they are aware of that. Now there's two kind of scientific principles in reading that I want to just kind of overview first. Uh, so one is the concept of quiet eye. So quiet eye is actually something I discovered or learned about over 20 years ago in university. Um, and the researcher of quiet eye, the lead researcher around the world, her name is Dr. Joan Vickers, and she's a professor at the University of Calgary. And so what the concept of quiet eye is actually where, like it looks at where is our eye focusing um, and where are we looking in relationship to space and in sport when we're executing certain skills. It's really commonly used in target acquisition type skills. Okay, so if I'm a shooter and I'm shooting at a target, right, or even if I'm a football player and I'm trying to catch a ball that's flying at me, right, or in our case in volleyball, if I'm trying to receive a serve, quiet eye is the ability for the eye to have a continual gaze or focus on a specific target. So that target can be stationary, like a target on the wall, or that target can be moving, like the ball coming at me and I need to pass it. And what we know from quiet eye is the longer my gaze fixation is on that object, the more accurate my response will be to that object, or to making a response to that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about quiet eye, and the other thing though is just what I call the man on the galloping horse, okay? So our ability to pick up visual information is going to be improved if we're not a man on a galloping horse, okay? If I'm standing still and if my head's not changing, I'm not making lots of big movements, I'm gonna do a better job of picking up visual information, okay? So that's just another component. That is different than quiet eye, okay? And for the longest time, I just kind of lumped those all in the same. They're not the same thing. One is me visually moving, my ability to actually fixate gaze. Right, the quiet eye comp component is actually looking at where my eyes are and trying to be very fixated within and smooth within my gaze pattern. Okay, the last one I want to talk about is perception action coupling. 
Okay? So this is an entire area and field of research, and I do not research in this area. I'm just a nerd, and I like reading a lot of papers about this stuff and finding out how I can apply it to volleyball. So perception action coupling is essentially that with every skill we execute, there's a perception component that comes with that first. And it's imperative that we, uh, and this is kind of from the first bit that I started with, but that we train both, right? That the perception piece, though, leads the action component. And if we try and break one down and we, I, and we train them in isolation, so that could be the idea of, I'm just going to show you a video of a setter setting balls in front and setting behind, setting in front and setting behind. You're just going to watch that video, and I don't care how good that the angle is and how realistic it is, if all you do is watch that video, and then you just go left, right, and I'm the blocker, I'm just reading the setter. Oh, it's right, it's left, it's right, it's left. That is not going to be as good as me actually linking the action that's required. So if I read that the ball is going to my right, I link the movement of my first jab step, hands down, right, that Tom was talking about in blocking. So when I do that read component, I don't want to isolate the action out, and I don't want to just do the action without doing the read. I want to, the two are coupled, okay? So those are some key pieces. And then the last one just about that is really what Tom already talked about is specificity, is that the perception of what we're perceiving needs to be game-like, and it needs to be realistic. And then the action needs to also mirror the same thing. So the action that we do should also be realistic. So those are some foundational kind of components of reading that I want us to be fairly confident with or understanding before we kind of get into, and I'll break down the different skills and my thoughts on the different skills and where reading as a loose kind of term falls within each of them. Is there any questions about that before I get into the next one, next stuff? Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to talk first off about serving, because this is probably where we have the lowest read demand, but there is still a read demand within serving. Okay, so you could say that we have a read demand of reading the opposition on the other side of the net and where they're passing, and that's fine, but there's no real st strict time constraints, so I don't even really worry about that. But we should, as a server, have an idea of where we want to serve the ball. Okay, if we actually think of it from a quiet eye perspective, quiet eye would say that if I was serving the ball here, if I didn't need to actually, if I was just throwing the ball to a target, quite I should, would say that I'm going to be more accurate if I fixate the gaze on where I'm going to throw the ball, and I just throw it. Unfortunately, in volleyball, we have to toss the ball up in the air, and we got to hit a moving object. So we don't have the luxury of just looking at our target. Okay, But there is a light read component of where we serve the ball to. The bigger read component is our toss itself. The number one reason that your players say they miss their serve is why? Bad toss, right? They all say it was a bad toss. That's the number one reason that they say they miss their serve. So I coach primarily university men. They all jump serve, okay? They all toss the ball up in the air. Some of them toss the ball really high up in the air. Their ability to toss the ball really, really high up in the air and then do a full spike serve, right, and toss the ball consistently the exact same every single time is near impossible. And we broke it down. We just overlaid video with a set camera that we just didn't move. And we did ghost, what's called like a ghost overlay. You just like have the same player go over and over and over again. And what we just looked at was just the trajectory of the toss. And we had one of our players who was a pretty good server. And what we saw was that his serve varied on where he made contact by up to a meter on a consistent basis. And this was a fifth year university player. He's consistently tossing his spike serve a meter forward or back. That's where he's making contact with it, right? So there's a lot of variability. So what does he have to do in order to keep hitting those serves at similar type of outcomes is he's got to read his toss, okay? So that is a component of this. So I always say, like, you can have a bad toss and you can have great feet, right? And great feet is a result, that's the action of us perceiving the bad toss, okay? As the time constraint comes down, so if I'm hitting a jump float, and especially if I'm like a late toss jump float, I don't have as much variability there to adjust to a bad toss, and I get that. However, I have some. Okay, so a bad toss should not be an excuse to just like wailing on a ball and being nowhere close to putting it in. Right, so hopefully we can help athletes can start to develop a modification or an adjustment to a bad toss to at least put a ball maybe still in the court. And we would talk about that all the time. Players would miss a ball, like we'd have guys that would foom a ball 30 meters out the back. Like, yeah, it was a bad, bad toss, coach. 
Like, well, it was a worse swing. And it was a worse read of that bad toss than the toss was, right? You just compounded the error on this one. Okay, so on serving, pretty basic. That's essentially what we look at. So how do we do it, though? So as a coach, or as an athlete, as I toss the ball up, using the quiet eye comment that we talked about earlier, we want to have a fixated gaze on the ball, right? And ideally, the athlete should be able to focus on the ball and have a very consent, like focused on the ball and not have our eyes actually fall off the ball or away from the ball. Now, you will not know this, and this is the hardest part of trying to train that, but there's eye tracking technology. We're actually doing a bunch of stuff with beach volleyball that if I have time at the end, I'll get into that talks about how we could do this and some stuff we're doing in this area. But what we just want to make sure the athletes are aware of is the toss on their serve, then they have a real strong focus on the ball. The eye does not come off the ball until contact has been made with the ball. That's going to increase our ability to make the right motor pattern to contact the ball to hit our best serve. Okay? That might be the easiest one, and I think I just talked for five minutes on reading the toss of a serve. Okay, so now we're going to get into um, passing and receiving. So for this one, actually, left sides and liberos. Hands up. Okay, so you four are going to go down that side. You're going to pass. You guys are going to serve on this side. Okay, just want one, we're just going to have one passer in the middle of the court. The other three are going to be waiting off. You'll just wave through. Okay, servers, you can serve game serves just anywhere you want to serve. Okay, just go ahead. Okay, and just wave through. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is as a passer, they have to pass the entire court in this situation. And I'm just doing this to emphasize. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, so I'm just doing this to emphasize the ability to them to read the serve that's about to come at them. So they don't know where the server is going to serve. Okay? You don't have to serve every ball right at position six, right at the person. Help me out here. Okay? Keep going. So the first read as a receiver is what? What's the first thing that gives them information of where this ball is going to be served? The toss, but even before the toss, the it's the approach of the server themselves, okay? Unless they're standing and they have no approach, the vast majority of servers are going to serve the ball in a very straight line from where they start their approach to where they take off, okay? So let's watch these servers and see if we can see some of that. Just hit your game server. Pretend there was three passers over there, okay? And as a receiver, we should start to be able to see, are, this, are they going towards position one? Are they going towards position five? Are they going towards position six, okay? Keep going a few more. So if I'm doing this drill and I'm trying to figure out the read of my receiver and their ability to read the initial kind of angle of where the server is coming from, I would likely stand behind my receiver, right? And from there, what I can see is I can see what they're seeing. I see a similar angle to what they're seeing. And I can see when they make their move left or right. I can't see their eyes, but at this point, their eyes aren't telling me a whole lot other than I know that they're looking at a server in general, okay? So that's kind of step one, is just understanding that. So now let's go to two-person server, Steve. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll go two-person, same thing, just whoever passes, cycle out, okay? So now what we want to see is the non-passer takes a step in the direction of the ball. Both passers are gonna, trying to pass the ball, but if you don't pass it, or if it's not yours, or towards the other person, you at least take a step towards that area. Okay, go ahead. Okay, right at that person. So you need to take a step towards them. Okay, so then I know you've made the read that it's not coming to you. Okay, give a bit more space between you so you can make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so you opened up, same idea. Okay, so what we should be able to see is what I'm getting at here is there's a lot of information. Just hold up for a second. There's a lot of information that the receiving core knows before a serve is ever even contacted, okay? Very, very few servers approach here and then serve there. Some do, some are capable of doing that. The other thing is the vast majority of servers serve where they look, right? So they do whatever routine they do, they bounce, 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 spin, spin, bounce, bounce, spin, spin, whatever it is, right? And then they look. That's where I'm gonna serve. And then they go and do it. And they don't serve to a place where they haven't already looked. That's a very common one. So as a passer, our first read skills that we're developing information and acquiring information is exactly that. Okay, that's the first and that's the real easy part. Okay, the next thing, and Tom talked about this a little bit. We go from a broad 
okay, to a more narrow focus. And that's very common across most skills. So as we're talking about reception here, what we see is we have a server that's about to serve the ball, and we see their general approach angle and approach path, okay? We, the next piece is we see their toss, okay? And as we go from broad to narrow, we have toss relative to their approach angle and to their body. And we can start to make some ideas understanding where they may serve that ball, right? Obviously, the wrist can still manipulate, but we start to gather some information, okay? So that's, we're pretty broad. Okay, now the last one is as the, the server is about to contact the ball, what we've seen, and this, is a this is the one area there's a little bit of eye tracking and quiet eye technique um, train, uh, research that's been done on it. They start to focus on the area where the ball contact is about to occur before the ball is there and before the contact is made at that spot. And this is similar to defense as well. So what I mean by that is as you toss the ball as a server, right, you toss that ball up, the ball apexes, the ball comes back down, there's a spot in between where the ball's above, the server's below, but that's where contact's going to happen. Expert receivers, their eyes go to that spot early. And you know why? This now takes us back to the quiet eye piece. So now what it allows them to do is they're, they're going to see the ball at contact, and they're going to be able to start tracking the initial ball flight sooner. If their eyes go up with the ball, and then eyes come down with the ball, the ball gets struck, guess what the eyes keep doing? They keep going down. And then they get onto the ball. The ball's already traveled two meters, three meters, four meters, wherever it is, right? So the first part is we want to just have our athletes focus on let's get above the server to that space before the contact has happened. And that's my feedback to them. The hardest piece of all of this, as I mentioned, is I don't know if their eyes have actually done it. I just have their behaviors to go off of to try and get an idea if they maybe have or not. Okay, so I want to try and get into that spot, and that's the place I want to try and be focused. Okay, and then the last thing is I want to stay on that ball and fixate it on that ball all the way until I'm just about at passing to contact the ball. Okay, the common question that I get at this point is do I need to watch the ball hit my platform? Okay, the little bit of research that we have expert performers stop ball tracking about a meter before pass contact. The reason for that, theoretically, is that in order for me to track that ball right into my arms, I have to make a big head movement. The big head movement, I lose the ball anyways. So it doesn't really matter. So expert performers, you'll see them, they'll keep a very level head, they'll track that ball, track that ball, track the ball, and then they'll lose it about a meter before. The other thing about expert performers, so a novice performer, that might help them a little bit, but I'm guessing it's not going to make a big difference. Again, this is what we have from the evidence we have. The other thing that's interesting is if we predict the ball flight, if the ball flight at, this, at a point is predictable, we now have the ability to get off of the ball and onto our target of where we now want to say pass this ball to. So we can start to now look at where's my setter and I can start passing towards the general zone of my setter. So my eyes can start to kind of go to that zone. This is exactly what tennis players do. So this has been researched to death in tennis. Tennis players will take their eye off of a ball on receive of serve. That's how fast do they serve? 100 and, I don't know. I'm going to say 100 kilometers an hour, whatever it is. Okay, they serve the ball pretty hard. Okay, so that ball will bounce. It'll be coming up towards their racket. They will take their eyes off of that ball three meters before the ball hits the racket. Okay, that ball's three meters away from hitting their racket, and where do their eyes go? It goes to the space where they want to hit the next ball, too. Okay, now it starts getting into the quiet eye piece. They'll start to fixate, and you'll have a, a real specific spot on the other side of the net of where they're about to swing, and they're still in their full backswing. They're not even looking at the ball anymore. They're looking at where they want that ball to go. Okay? For us, we don't really need to get on the setter. The setter, for the most part, if we train them really well, just like what Tom said, we know where they're going to be, we know where we need to pass for. That's not as important that they get on the setter, right? But I also don't think we need to make a big head movement to try and follow right into our platform. This is my opinion. Just throwing it out there. Okay, so let's, see, let's do a couple reps on that and just see if you can kind of feel it. Okay, so watch ball flight and see if you can get above. And you guys as coaches, just watch right now. Can you watch, watch toss, watch player? Go broad to narrow and get into a focal spot where contact is about to occur pre-contact. Go. Okay. So you can kind of see it. That was a good one. Ball kind of taut. Keep going. Okay. 
the ball kind of tops out at the top of its toss. It's going to drop just a little bit, right? And we just want to get down to where that drop spot is, just underneath the ball pre-contact. Okay, that would be our ideal of to try and increase our ability to track that ball for longer. Okay. Good job. Okay, keep going. Check my notes, see what I missed. Okay, keep going. Okay, awesome. So we'll stop there. Did that feel any different than what you normally do? Or were you at least maybe putting some attention onto it? This is something that really becomes autonomous. Right? We don't even like talk about like the stages of motor learning. We don't even really think about it. But great athletes just naturally do it. We don't all get to work with great athletes all the time. So we have to start to train it and check, are they doing this? Is this kind of their approach? So we train this a lot. Um, I, we do a lot of serving in my gym when I was a coach. I'm not a coach anymore, so I'm not sure why I'm here. But um, what we try and do is we try and do a lot of stuff as well, serving on two, so there is a lot of court that they have to take, right? And they have to be able to make big read moves, and they got to make them early in order to get to balls. They're going to be served at sidelines and things like that. They're going to have to make some jumps on it. And that reason is just I want them to just, just focus on trying to get as much information as we can from the opposing team server, okay? What we're seeing right now at the high levels in particular, there's, in there's teams that are setting up in their full three-person serve receive, and pre-contact, one passer is completely bailing out. The whole serve receive is shifting. And the reason they're doing that is they've made a read that that serve is coming. So let's go three-person serve receive, just to give you an idea. Okay? So they'll have, say, like a real, they'll have a server that loves to serve down to position five, and serve position five a lot. And that person will toss, jump, and as they toss and jump and they know, these two will shift over and you'll bail out to hit the left side ball. Contact then happens. There was no one passing in position one or maybe they'll have like a back row opposite that will kind of step in a little bit just in case, right? But they're able to do that and they're able to do it really effectively. This is primarily men's indoor pro. We're seeing this quite a bit right now in Europe. A lot of teams are doing this to try and bail out a passer that's getting targeted and picked on a lot and a server that doesn't have a lot of range in the way they serve, right? So they can re make those reads early. Okay, cool. Any questions on the read skill on this? There's really no way to break this down into like chunks, right? You have to read a ball flight coming at you. Actually, sorry, the last thing I should mention though, there's three, we, in order of uh, time. So the first piece we understand when the ball leaves the, the server's hands, sorry, I forgot about this. When the ball leaves the server's hands, the first thing we know is angle. Okay, that's the first piece of information that we're able to pick up. So what I mean by that is that's what I was trying to talk to you guys about. Is it going to me or is it going to my partner? Is it going to my left? Is it going to my right? Right? We can start to discern that level of information really, really quickly in the serve process. Right? Left or right. The next stuff takes longer. So the next two components is velocity. So this is now depth. Is it going deep or is it going shallow? And that's a tougher one to understand. And you know who has the, the hardest? The person that the ball is flying directly at. Okay, the ball that's coming directly at you is the hardest ball to determine velocity on. The person that can tell velocity a lot easier is the person that has a side angle to the ball. I think that makes common sense for a lot of us, right? So, that's the second piece is velocity. So we start to understand how fast that ball is traveling. Okay? When I say angle, left or right, the other one I should have mentioned as well, we also know up and down. Right? So we know if the ball is going to be really loopy high. We know if the ball is going to be really close to the tape. Right? So we get that before we know the speed that it's traveling. The third component is what we kind of call like our spin rate. Right? So how much that ball is, the revolution of the ball. And the other way I like to think of it is almost like the, the, in baseball they call it the flight path. So we can determine the amount of drop or hook or whatever top spin that that ball has, and that's the last thing that we get. Okay, it's not long after, right? The velocity, but that spin rate and that flight path. So that's the, the last component, and this is all stolen from baseball. There's no research on this in volleyball. <laughs> okay, 
But those, that's the three components, and that's in the order in which we get it. Okay, so we should expect our athletes to know if the ball is left or right really, really early. But expect them to know if the ball is deep or short, especially if it's served at them, much later in that ball flight. All the more reason, though, we want to have a quiet eye and be on the ball flight early. Okay, make sense? Okay, um, the next one would be setting, but I'm not going to go over setting because I think Tom really talked a lot about it. Um, what I found is that most setters are just ball watchers. Okay, so all they do is they just watch the ball come in, ball hits some object, and then ball bounce out, and then they just chase ball. Right? And that is 90% of the setting read that we see. But when I see setters and I see their head, especially ball crosses tape, and this is the cue that we use, ball crosses tape, we want to snap to passer. Right? So the minute I know that that ball is across the tape and I'm not going to have to make a play on it or someone else is going to have to make a play on it, and I know it's passed, then who's passing that ball? I want to snap and I want to get on that platform and get as much information as I can in a relatively short period of time. And often against really, and this is again, I'm talking very high velocity servers, we actually, to get any information, we need to get on the receiver before the ball is even at our tape. The ball is just traveling too fast. My head's moving, the ball's already hit their platform, I got nothing. So against real high velocity spin servers, what we basically say is that you hear it hit the tape, right? Your eyes are already on the passer. Because we have gotta try and get some information to give us a, a jump to be able to react fast to that pass ball. That's the only thing I'd probably add into Tom's comments. Okay, any questions passing setting? All right, let's get into hitting. So you guys can come on. Uh, yeah, let's, let's hit on this side. Um, you guys can pass. Let's get a couple. We have a lot of setters, right? Just four setters. So you guys can just cy circle through. Um, and then do you guys want to block position two for me? Just go one-on-one -on -one block. OK, you guys can just, we're just going to hit um, huts left side. OK? And we'll just have just a single block over here. Um, no, you guys can cycle there, it's fine. There's three, they can cycle there, it's enough. Okay, so on the attacking side, if we go in order of importance, okay, so the first read that the, the, the attacker is going to get, the first thing they understand is where the pass is. Right, so now they start to understand how are they going to adjust their approach based on the pass. So the pass is way off the net, they're going to have a slower approach, right? If the pass is way off the net, do they have to kick wide and their, change their approach angle? Right? Is the pass perfect right on the spot? So the first component is actually the passer. Okay? So it's very similar if I'm a left side attacker. I'm using the, the left side attacker as my focus here. So it's very similar to what we talked about with the setter. So the non-passer, left side attacker, essentially they need to open up and see that pass, make a read where that pass is going, and then see the ball off of the passer right? and understand the quality of the set, what's going to happen, how they have to adjust their approach. Those are the first components. Okay, now setters getting to the ball, we're going to say, okay, setters getting to the ball and they're about to set the ball. Okay, then the next one is starting to read our setter. So again, are we able to run tempo and everything else? So let's assume all of these things are just check, check, check. It's perfect pass, it's in system, setter's there, setter can set the ball, okay? Setter now sets the ball. Where do we want to be looking as an attacker? talked a bit. Let's answer one really que easy question. Easy answer. The setter has just set the ball. I'm a left side attacker. I'm about to attack the ball. What do I want to be looking at? The ball. Okay. I need to get most of my information from the ball. Okay. We also, when we talk about quiet eye, I need to make an action, right, based on a perception of where this ball is going to end up. So I need to either make adjustments to my approach in order to optimize my ability to get to that ball and hit the ball. So my eyes don't actually ever come off the ball. Okay? The difference with attacking is this is where we start to really get into peripheral training and peripheral vision training. Okay? My eyes don't leave the ball. The best hitters in the world, indoor volleyball, okay, are not doing this and then looking back at the ball and hitting it. Okay? The best are just looking at the ball the whole time. That's all that they're looking at. Okay. However, they position themselves in ways by jumping from behind the ball, keeping the ball out in front of them as that ball comes across, that they have great peripheral. Right? So they can see a block, they can see a hole, they can see a middle that's late to close, 
right? So they have a lot of vision outside of the ball, okay? So what we're going to just do real quickly here is you guys are just going to hit left side balls, outside blockers. All I want you to do is go hard line, hard cross. Make one read or the other. Hitter just hit opposite of where they're blocking you. Simple enough, right? Let's see how it goes. Here you go. Okay, hard line, hard cross reads. Okay, so do you think she had much peripheral on that? Is that a read issue or is it a technical issue? She was fading away, right? So didn't have the ball out in front of us. She's not going to have any peripheral. She's not going to have the ability to make a read skill. That's a technical. Okay, here we go. Keep the ball out in front of us. Good, keep going. Okay, so a real hard line. Take a solid, solid line or solid, solid cross. Make a strong move, okay? Make it early, okay? Strong move and make it real early, blockers. You don't have to... Oh, what happened there? What happened, hitter? What's that? Yeah, well, and you don't need to look at the blocker, but we didn't pick up peripheral information, right? We had no peripheral. We didn't see that they were taking us cross. Or we did, we didn't recognize, we weren't able to process the peripheral information that we gathered. Okay? As a coach training an attacker, I think it took till I was coaching at a university level before I ever thought of training my hitters to be able to do this. Now that I coach primarily at a university level, this is what we spend the majority of our time working on, is the ability to get vision and understand what shots are available to them. And there's always their fallbacks. And you'll coach great athletes that have no peripheral vision. But they just know if they hit the ball really, really high, they, at the top of their reach, and they hit it to that corner, it scores a lot of points. And you'll have players that can do that. And that can be really, really good and really, really effective at high levels of university. And that's very possible. However, in my opinion, if they have peripheral vision as well, those are the ones that are the all-stars and MVPs. Those are the ones that are going on to national teams because they are just, it's really special to see, right? We had one at UBC. His favorite thing he used to love to do was when the block dove cross on him. So he'd be coming into hit here, and the block would dive cross, and he'd go, he's right-handed. He would just let the ball come across, and he'd just left-hand tip. And then he would just do it all the, he'd do it all the time. And then people are like, oh, we've got to defend the left-hand tip. And then you just bang cross, bang cross, bang cross. And like just playing a little game. But his vision was really, really good. His peripheral vision was awesome, even though all he focused on was the ball. His eyes didn't leave the ball. Okay? Any questions about that component? How am I for time? Let's 15 minutes? Okay, good. Um, okay, so that was the first, or uh, what am I missing? I got to check my notes so I don't get... Yeah, so some of the ways that we also train this, and we do as part of a bit of a warm-up drill, and just to get hitters starting to think about blocking and making reads off of the block itself, is we play a lot of 2v2. So let's do this real quick. You guys can go 2v2 half court. Okay, another four over here go 2v2 half court. Okay, so you guys just enter your own ball. Okay, so what we're going to do here, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You don't know what you're doing yet. Okay, so what we're going to do here is if the blocker blocks... Okay, if the blocker jumps up and blocks, you're going to tip. Okay, and you just tip over to the, it's a continuous drill. If the blocker stays down, you're going to roll. In both situations, you're trying to put the ball to the passer. But the skill that you use is based just on what the opposing blocker does. So this is the idea we talk about the perception action, right? We perceive something that's happening, and then we make an action. This is a very generic, basic example of it that we could do. But we would try and do similar things, obviously, going more game-like, right? But just go 2v2, and you guys do that. OK, so if blocker blocks, what do you do? Tip. OK, if blocker jumps, you tip. Good. OK. okay. Grab ball here, ball here. Just toss it in. Good. What's our success rate? I'd say as good as chance right now, probably. All right? OK, let's we'll leave it there. That's fine. OK, so we play a lot of 2v2 for warm-up, not necessarily for this reason of like if blocker blocks or not. 
right? But we will do things where same idea, but we want them to try and score, and blockers have to make some big read moves. And this is really common, say, in beach volleyball, where they dive hard cross, stay line, and the attacker has to hit the opposite of what they do. So we'll play 2v2 with that exact goal, right? Is we have to hit away from whatever the blocker's doing. We want blockers to make big read moves. So make big cross, big line, okay? Any questions on attack, read? Okay, we're gonna get into block. Um, I'll, I'm gonna start off with a story this is just one of my favorite ones. It just kind of reiterates with me. So when we talk about blocking and the read skill of blocking, actually, when we talk read skill in volleyball, the first thing that almost everyone thinks about is blocking. It's like it's the only skill that we actually have to read in. It's the hardest, right? It has the, it's the most complex, right? So I was talking with Graham Vigras, who Calgarian, Canuck alum, um, and currently with our men's national team. And I was chatting with him this summer a little bit about his blocking and about his ability to read the opposing setter and like when he thinks he's really on and when he thinks he's off and what are the differences. And so we're sitting, we're chatting about this and the one thing that he talked about is like, if I'm struggling with my ability to read the opposing setter, all I try and do is look at them for longer. Okay, so if we think about that from what I've talked about today, that kind of aligns a little bit with what we were talking about with the quiet eye, right, and fixation of gaze. So what he started talking about, he doesn't, he doesn't know what quiet eye is, he doesn't know what fixation of gaze is, even though as I, was, I was his coach, he's forgotten anything I ever taught him. That's why he's good. Um, but that's what he wants to do. He's like, so I'm a middle blocker, all I'm really struggling to read the setter, I just want to get on the setter earlier. And I want to stay on the setter longer. So the pass happens. I see ball setter. I want to get to setter, and I want to watch earlier and longer. And we started breaking that down. Why is that? Why is it you want to be on the setter earlier? Why does that really matter? The setter can do whatever they do early changes by the time the ball actually leaves their setter's hands, right? But what we started to kind of, and the theory, and again, this is very theoretical, is that there's a lot of information that accumulates prior to that set release, right? So he's like, well, I just see like maybe that rhythm into the ball, and I see when his rhythm was more like this, he likes to do that, and there's all, some little things. Karch Karai talks about it, he called it the hinky. You heard about this? Karch talked about the hinky before. So same idea, and it was actually from border guards on the Mexico-USA border. And border guards, just someone would pull up, and the border guards would be like, yeah, his passport, blah, blah, blah. He's like, yeah, just pull over the side. You're going to be inspected. And he'd ask, so then the supervisor would ask the border guard, well, so why did you pull that person over. It's like, I don't know, something just, something seemed off. And they saw that they were pretty accurate. Their ability to pull people over was, was fairly accurate, but they couldn't pinpoint what it was. When I talked to Graham about what's his read and why he needs to get on the setter earlier, and even when he's like, oh, I got that setter. That setter, I, I can read him. It's so easy for me. I'm like, what is it? It's like, I have no idea. I don't know what it is. I'm like, is it his elbows? Is it his contact point? Is it what? It? He goes, I, I don't know. He goes, I just kind of go autonomous. I just read the setter, read the setter, read the setter. And he goes, and then I just release and I block balls. So he doesn't know what it is, but he knows that if he's looking at information rich areas, and if he's looking there for longer, he makes better reads. Okay. So when I'm training blockers, the most important piece to me is getting on the setter. Okay. So we have to be able to get on the setter. So we talk balls, Tom talked ball setter, ball hitter. I'm sure I probably, I miss Joe, Shannon. They probably have all talked ball setter, ball hitter all day today. Okay. So, but to me, I just really want to emphasize the setter component of ball setter, ball hitter. The second thing I like to talk a little bit about when it's with read skills is how long do we need to see the set and keep our eyes on the ball itself out of the setter's hands? Okay. Any idea? Well, first off, we talked about earlier when I was talking serving. How long does it take for us to know the direction of the ball is being set, left or right? Right? It's almost odd. Like the ball leaves the setter's hand. I know if it's going left or right. That is immediate. What do I not know? I don't know velocity yet. I don't know how hard it's going in that direction. Okay? So I might not know if it's a quick to the middle, a pipe, or a bick, or a go, or a left side ball. I might not know that immediately. That might take another couple of inches of ball flight, right, before I have now enough information to start process velocity, and now I can make moves, okay? So if I'm a, the read skill gets harder as we have complexities in movement that's required from that, 
Okay, so if I'm a position two blocker here, okay, and I have a setter over there, if that setter, if I, if I only have one hitter in the zone, so if that middle, let's say they run like a 30, they run a long, long quick, right? That's not in my zone. Let's say they have no pipe or bick at all. I have one hitter in my zone, back row setter, right? My read skills are pretty basic. If they set back, I know who I got. If they set front, cool, I get to play defense, right? My read skills are a lot more basic. So obviously the more complex is when we start to have com more components that we need to block. Um, the thing called Hicks Law that I want to talk about a little bit here as well. And this will help you a little bit. If you got a setter that just freezes in the moment, right? And we all have had this situation. Okay, so perfect pass comes in to the setter. Setter jump sets, all options are available, and your middle just kind of stands there, right? And the ball gets set, and they go, oh, crap. You know, we know that our ability to react to a stimulus is quicker depending on the number of potential options that we have. If you want to make it easier for that middle, give them a limited amount of responsibility. So if I say, hey, all I want you to do is either move to your right, right, if they set to, the, to your right, I want you to just move to your right or move to your left. That's the only thing I want you to do. If they set the ball to the middle, if you can, jump, great. But that's not the priority. The priority here is left and right. Let's not get left and right wrong. If that's all we do, guess what? They're going to get a lot faster at moving left and right. So if we eliminate options and we don't have to try and block everything, we're going to be better in our read skills. And that's because of the action options, so our ability to go through and be like, okay, I perceive this. Okay, now what does that mean? I got to go with X, Y, or Z, right? Our ability to process that is slower. If all I have to do, if I'm playing whack-a-mole, and this is the way I like to use it, if I'm playing whack-a-mole and there's only two moles, I'm pretty good, okay? But if I'm playing whack-a-mole and there's five, right, I'm a lot slower, okay? And there's an exponential piece to this, so eventually it doesn't matter. If you go to four stimulus to eight stimulus, it's not really any different. But one to two, right, one, two to four, right, those are going to be a lot, lot harder. Okay, so back to what we were talking about, those actually reading. So I'm on the setter. From setter, we go to ball, ball flight, we get our direction first, then we're going to get velocity, okay? And now we need to get back on the hitter. Now, this is where things get really, really interesting. We've done quite a bit of eye tracking work, and I'm working with a company and a guy out of the States that's done a lot of NCAA eye tracking work. What they find is that middle blockers rarely get back, they won't basically get on the hitter on first tempo balls. So what I mean by that is that if they run a quick, the eye sequencing that we see is ball, setter, ball, that's it. They don't have time to go to the hitter. The hitter's already in the air and is hitting the ball, okay? Getting back to the hitter, however, becomes important for the outside, okay? So as outside blockers, our ability to snap from being ball down onto the hitter becomes really important. So let's do that a couple times. Let's have, you guys can hit, uh, Get a couple of hit, are you, setters, you can hit right side as well, okay? So we have left side and right side, okay? And let's just have outside blockers on both sides. You can outside block here, that's fine, okay? Let's just watch, and all I want you to watch is the head, okay, angle of our outside blockers here. So what we should see is they're on ball, they should have a bit of an upwards gaze, right? And then we should see a real level head and a look outwards towards the sideline, and we should see a hitter gaze. Okay, here we go. Okay, so just watch. Yeah, do you see that? Okay, so she went ball, boom, found her hitter. Okay, here we go. What do we think there? Get on earlier, even earlier. Okay, so here we go. So we're going to go ball, 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 ball. Hitter, 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 hitter. Good. Okay, and we have quite a bit of time where we can get on hitter. Okay, a few more here. Ball, 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 hitter, 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 good. Okay, so what is it now that our hitter tells us? Okay, so what information does our hitter tell us? They actually tell us some of the same information that the ball does, if we were just to stay on ball the whole time. We're not a talkative group, end of the day, I get it. Okay, so the ball tells us if the ball, or sorry, the hitter tells us if the set is inside. Well, at least it tells us that they're going to go inside. If the set's inside and they don't tell us it's inside, well, they're probably not hitting it anyway, so you don't need to worry, okay? 
So the hitter tells us if the set's inside. The hitter tells us if the set is off the net. The hitter tells us if the set is outside. The hitter tells us if the set is fast, right? Because we time our jump in relationship to their jump, okay? So we know that our blockers, for the most part, are going to block, you know, a couple milliseconds after the attacker, or sorry, jump. Our blockers are going to jump a couple milliseconds after the attacker jumps, okay? So the hitter can tell us a lot. The last thing is, and this is a transfer over from we talked about serving earlier, most servers serve in the direction of their approach. Most hitters hit in the direction of their approach, okay? So I like to use the analogy, if I jump from right here, okay, and I hit the ball right here, and I put those two dots on the ground, and now I just draw an arrow and give myself about two meters on either side of that arrow, I bet that's 85% of the balls, okay? Our ability to increase that range is something we should work on with our attackers, but that's not for this talk, okay? So blockers, we want to see where they take off from and where they land. And that's going to give us a lot of information of where that ball is probably going. Okay, so that's kind of more gross. We talk wide. That's their approach angle. I don't need to look at their shoelaces to know their approach angle. I see their whole body. That's going wide. Okay, now we start to get back to narrow. Okay, the information-rich area that we talked about earlier, right, up above the hitter, that's where the ball is going to be contacted. That makes sense for a defender. It doesn't make sense for our eyes to come off the attacker to get to that spot because we need to make our move earlier. Okay, so what we do is we go broad attacker and then we just start going up towards shoulder. Okay, and then we go from shoulder to where elbow is and then we go from elbow to where hand is. Okay, so our focus gets really constricted up near where that contact is. Okay, so really good blockers, what you'll see is that they're going to be on gross hitter, and then their vision basically just starts going up the chain, up that attacker, okay, and then they're going to end up high on where that attacker is hitting the ball. Now, just quickly, is as a defender, the only difference in this whole sequence, this eye sequence component, is that I can get off of the hitter, and when I say off, I mean like more, um, less broad, and I can start to focus more on where that contact's going to be, right, so that I can start tracking that ball flight earlier and start making better reads on that ball. However, we still have to have enough peripheral, like we can't be too focused because we still have to read that tip, that roll, right, those last minute body adjustments, okay. So what we, there's a little bit of research that happened in beach volleyball that that's what they basically showed was that if the beach volleyball player was sitting here and they had the eye tracking goggles on, they'd be looking at the chest Okay, of the attacker, then as that attacker left the ground, it went to the shoulder, followed the shoulder, okay, and then from there it went above the hitter to where there's nothing happening right now. The elbow was like this. Lost audio. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, they focus up here, and they're focused on that, where that contact's about to happen, and then they're on ball. And then from there, they're able to track ball flight, right, and make a move and make an, um, make an action to that perception. Okay. Let me check my notes quickly, see if I missed any big components. Otherwise, I'll open up for questions. I think those are the main ones. Like, the only thing I didn't really get into too much, but I wanted to talk about the actual cues and how the eyes work and they sequence. But the only thing I didn't get into too much is really the, this how, like, setting up a drill to train this. And the reason for that, it was somewhat intentional. I talked about, like, we do the 2v2 stuff, talked about serving with passers, but the this is the key component of as long, uh, back to the beginning, is as long as my perception skill is specific, it's going to transfer. As long as my read and action skill is specific, it's going to transfer. So you can do whatever drills you like to do. Just ask yourself if those two components are game-like, happening at game-like speeds, it's going to transfer. And with training, this is the last thing I'll probably say, probably, I won't guarantee, um, is that we want to try and increase complexity. So when I talked about the read skill with the middle, we maybe just want to go left and right, okay? And then we can add the middle in, right? So we can, we can chunk this down. This is, you know, part, you could say part training, right? But it's still making decisions between and being able to work on read skills. As long as those read skills are game-like, there's still going to be positive transfer to those experiences, okay? 
I think I'll leave it there. Any questions from you guys? Thank you, girls. Appreciate it.